presented by uh, my fellow Devil's Lake District co-workers Darren Lindblom and Dustin Legacy. Darren Lindblom began, began working for the NDDOT in January of 2008 in the DOT Support Center of the campus of NDSU. After graduating in May of 2008 from NDSU with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, he moved to Devil's Lake and began working in the district. In 2013, Darren was promoted to team leader and has been in that position since. Darren has been a part of many changes with the NDDOT, including changes in cars, implementing iPads, and e-tickets. He is currently on the NDDOT UAS committee and is a licensed uh, drone pilot. When Darren is not at work, you can probably find him at the golf course. Darren uh, enjoys golf so much, he even built a golf simulator in his garage so he can uh, golf year round. Uh, and uh, now to introduce his uh, co-presenter, uh, Dustin Legacy. Uh, Dustin received his associate's degree in construction management from North Dakota State College of Science in 2012. Following graduation, he worked for Bros Engineering and Stanley for three years as a construction technician. In 2015, he began working for the Devil's Lake District as an engineer technician. Dustin is a member of the Survey Committee and Unmanned Aircraft Systems Committee. Dustin is also a licensed commercial drone pilot. He resides in Devil's Lake with his wife, Ashley, and five-month-old son, Braxton, where he enjoys golfing, fishing, and spending time with his family. And from here, I'll hand over the, uh, the virtual microphone to Dustin to begin their presentation. Good afternoon. Darren and I will be giving you an update on the NDDOT UAS program and how we are utilizing them. So these are just some of the reasons for getting into UASs in the state here for inspections and survey and along with helping people inspect and survey in areas that are unsafe, such as this high mass lighting where we're able to go up and inspect it with a drone instead of getting into bucket trucks. So hopefully someday there'll be no need for bucket trucks anymore and we can stay safely on the ground. So other inspections include bridge inspections, highway construction projects, which we fly periodically. I've either taken pictures and videos to show what work has been done and the work process that is being done. That way come fall when we're closing out projects, we can look back on videos or pictures to verify when and how long some of the items took to complete. And then some of the survey aspects we're looking for is the potential to produce quantities, such as intermittent borrow payments, some common excavation estimates, and stockpile payments. Along with, we've been doing a lot of uh, stockpile measuring for the maintenance side of it as well. So we're hoping to be able to include that too instead of trying to measure the uneven piles with GPS or robotics. The NDDOT started out with 17 pilots when the program was first initiated. And these 17 pilots were made up of three districts, including Grand Forks, Devil's Lake, and Minot, along with communications, construction services, design, materials and research, maintenance, and strategy and innovation out of Bismarck. So since we started back in 2019, we have added seven more pilots. So we have 24 that fly for the NDDOT as of today. And we also have added at least one person from every district and the bridge division has also gotten involved now. These are some of the UASs that the NDDOT currently owns and started out with. We have nine Mavic 2 Zooms, two Mavic 2 Pros, one Mavic 2 Enterprise, and four Mavic 2 Minis. As you can see, I've listed all locations of where they're housed at. 
So a little info on some of the specs on it. The Mavic 2 Zoom and the Mavic 2 Pro are essentially the same drone, just different camera setups. So the similarities with the drones themselves, they can fly up to a maximum speed of 48 miles an hour and they have a flight time of 31 minutes. And they both will shoot video in 4K. A couple of the differences between the Pro and the Zoom is the Pro has a 20 megapixel image resolution while the Zoom is only at 12 meg megapixels. The Pro has a fixed 28 millimeter focal length camera, while the Zoom has a variable from 24 millimeter to 48 millimeter focal length. And then the image sensor <clears throat> is doubled with the Pro versus the Zoom. So if you want crisp, clear pictures, the uh, Pro would be the camera to have versus if you want kind of like a cinematic <clears throat> video type structure, then the zoom is the better camera. And then also these little DJI Mavic minis we have that can fit in the palm of your hand are kind of the test drones we have for any of our up and coming pilots that are getting licensed. They can have a little flying time before they hop on the joysticks for the bigger drones we use for the, our purposes. These are two newly acquired UASs we just received, actually Monday here, the 15th. The top one is a Watts Innovation Prism, and the bottom one is a Skydio S2 Enterprise. And this drone right here is a new one that the NDDOT is looking to acquire. We haven't bought one yet. It's a Skydio X2E, which they're gearing for bridge inspection due to the fact it has a camera that can look 90 degrees straight up or 90 degrees straight down. Some of the benefits of using Skydio are they are designed, assembled, and supported in the USA, which is kind of a big factor right now with DJI being made in China. They don't need GPS to fly. They are based on cameras and sensors with AI integrated with it. So this means they can go into places that the satellites aren't necessarily gonna be there, such as underneath bridges, around structures of any kind that's gonna block the signal. And they also do have a GPS on board. So if you're going to do any kind of 3D modeling with it, it'll still be geo referenced when you come bring it into the computer to do any kind of editing of a surface. So and with all the cameras and sensors, they have a 360 degree field of view. So it has a very good obstacle avoidance. From the sounds of it, they're very hard to crash as long as the structure everything is staying put they do have a little bit i've heard they got a little bit of trouble with some things in motion that they might not quite pick up on so some of the s2 enterprise capabilities the one that we just received it has a three and a half kilometer range or just over two miles the camera is a 4K camera that does 60 frames per second and has a 12.3 megapixel, megapixel resolution. The flight time on it is 23 minutes, so it is less than the DJI Mavics we currently have. But we are hoping to find some more variables for the 3D scanning so we can start coming up with more reliable numbers and quantities. So the S2 Enterprise is the little blue one on the right, on the bottom, and then the X2E, which is showing the drone up top, and then that one also folds in, versus the S2 does not fold. That's how it stays. So the flight time is 35 minutes for the X2E, and the big benefit, like I said before, it has a 180 degree vertical view, 
so you can look straight up and straight down. And this one has a six kilometer range, so 3.7 miles roughly, and it does fold up to be more compact and can travel a little easier. So as uh, Dustin mentioned, uh, we also this week just got a Watts Innovation Prism drone. Um, this one I'm kind of calling our workhorse. Um, it's very, it, it can be configured in many different ways. Um, you can switch out the propulsion system to either a uh, quadcopter or as we got it, it's an X8 coaxial which means it has four arms with two propellers in each arm. Uh, the reason we went with uh, the Prism is it's fully made in America. So with a lot of drones coming from China and the security concerns, uh, we wanted to make sure that we got one that was fully made in America. Uh, with the configuration we have, it has a 25 pound payload capacity while staying under the 55 pound max for a small UAS and it's also capable of handling many different accessories. Uh, right now we're just looking at getting a Sony camera system and a LiDAR system for it but you can also mount thermal cameras. Um, they make a, a sprayer attachment for it and many different uh, accessories that will mount right to it. As I mentioned, uh, we're looking at a, a LiDAR system. Uh, we're working through the state's procurement to uh, purchase this. Um, we're looking at the uh, Ranger Regal Minivux 3. Um, this is uh, capable of 200,000 measurements per second and as a 360 degree field of view. Also uses a, an SD card to store the data and uh, only weighs uh, 3.4 pounds. So it'll easily be able to mount on the uh, prism. And also has a very good uh, accuracy. But uh, these things don't uh, come cheap either. They're They're well into the six figures for LiDAR unit, so we want to make sure we did our homework and got one we needed. Uh, DOT, we, we've also been using a lot of different programs for the drones between flying, uh, pre-flight, and processing of the imagery. Uh, some of the flying apps we use, uh, the DJI Go4 app is one we use for the Mavics. Um, that allows us to view the cameras, um, see the altitude we're at, how far away it is, the GPS where it is, all through the app. Uh, there's also some other automated ones, uh, DJI GS Pro, uh, Litchi app, Botling Capture, and Pix4D Capture. Uh, all these programs allow you to pre-program a flight into the drone set it up how you want it to fly, what pictures to take, and then you just hit start, the drone takes off, flies its mission, and comes right back. So that's really nice to be able to pre-program everything and you don't have to try to free fly it. Uh, some of the pre-flight apps we've been using uh, just on our smartphones are Kitty Hawk and AirMap. Uh, these apps allow us to view the if there's any restrictions in the area and also apply for lance approvals in restricted airspace right through the app so we know if we're safe to fly and before we uh, get out there. Uh, we're also, the state is using a program called Drone Logbook, which allows each pilot to log all their flights into one main system and it keeps track of the flight that was made, what drone was used, and that way you can keep track of, you know, how many hours are getting on each drone, how many hours the pilots have, and we can have good, accurate records of 
what we're doing. Uh, we're also looking at uh, some different uh, processing apps. I don't know. People aren't real familiar with drones. Um, one of the main things most drones out there can do is uh, you can use them for photogrammetry, which you can take and fly and take overlapping photos of an area and then take those photos, put them into a program and download a 3D image like you see on the right there of a stockpile. Um, that image was flown with the uh, Pix4D capture app. And then uh, that one is actually came out of the Botlink program, which is an online cloud-based program where you download all the pictures into the program. And then the, the program will stitch all the photos together and give you a 3D image and then send it back to you. And from there, we can pull quantities off that stockpile and quickly and easily uh, get uh, quantities from it. Um, that stockpile right there took about an 18 minute flight with the drone. Drone took somewhere around 300 pictures. And then the program took about an hour to process. And then I was able to click within minutes and that piles somewhere around 60,000 cubic yards. So you can see by the picture, if you were to try to survey that the traditional way with a GPS or total station, trying to get down in all those valleys and would be very tough and very dangerous. That pile is probably 60 to 80 feet tall. So it'd be very tough to crawl around there and take shots on it. Uh, another program that we have in house is a Bentley context capture. Um, that program uses your computer to process the photos. So it that program takes a lot of computing horsepower, I'll call it. So right now only our photogrammetry guys in Bismarck are running that. They've got some uh, very high tech computers that can handle that easily. Um, we're also looking at purchasing a Pix4D. Uh, there's two versions of it. There's a cloud-based version that's very similar to Botlink where you download the pictures, they process it for you and send you back the data. And there's Pix4D Mapper, which is similar to the, bot the Bentley context capture where you your computer will process the images. But the Pix4D seems very user friendly and uh, so far we're pretty pleased with how it's working. Uh, the DOT has also uh, been part of uh, kind of the leading edge of some of the drone stuff. Uh, in 2018, DOT was selected as one of 10 participants in the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration Pilot Program. Uh, this was a three-year program to work on waivers to fly over people, fly at night, and to fly beyond visual line of sight. Uh, anyone who's familiar with drones know that that's against the normal rules of flying a drone. But as part of the program, we worked with the FAA and developed waivers, so we were able to fly with those different conditions and uh, help uh, create new rules for the FAA. Uh, like I said, one of the uh, waivers we got was uh, to fly at night. Um, you have the capability of flying between civil twilight hours, which is 30 minutes after sunset to 30 minutes before sunrise. To fly at night, you, it requires you to have anti-collision lights that can, that can be seen for up to three miles. Uh, they need to be either white or red. Uh, requires the pilot to be trained with night operations. And then you must ha have the waiver with you and all your correct documents. Uh, there's a picture on the right there, the Sorley Bridge that uh, I believe Jesse Catamaris over in uh, Grand Forks took during the flood. So 
kind of a cool picture at night. Uh, also, with the waivers, uh, starting April 21st of this year, we just found out this week, um, the rules for night flying and flying over people are going to change. Um, you're no, lo no longer going to need the waivers that we help make. Uh, it's going to be part of the rules of flying. So that's going to add more flexibility for the pilots to be able to uh, fly the missions and uh, not have to get waivers to fly them. Another one of the waivers was flying over people. Uh, th this picture was taken uh, one of the first times flew over people. It was a bison uh, tailgating event. Uh, to fly over people, you must have a, a parachute, uh, the, a waiver, and then also there's some other conditions with uh, how high you have to fly because a parachute has to be able to have time to open and stop the uh, aircraft from falling. So, and with the new rules, um, these are being integrated into the the normal flying. So, make sure you brush up on your your rules and regulations before you uh, attempt to do this. Uh, the last one the DOT is still working on is flying beyond the visual line of sight. Uh, the current rules are is you need to be able to see the drone to uh, fly and you need to see it with the naked eye. Um, with these waivers, you'll be able to fly out, you know, beyond from what you can see, which will allow you to, you know, fly a long section of road, maybe fly a long power line to inspect it, you know, opens up a lot of doors and what can be done. Currently, the Northern Plains UAS test site has a waiver for this, and the DOT is worked with them to use it if needed. Uh, we work very closely with the the test site on a lot of things. Uh, another version of this that we are currently looking at is called a tactical beyond visual line of sight, which by the picture next to you is a picture of a bridge. Um, currently, since you have to be in sight of it, if you were to fly underneath the bridge and you're on top, you can't see it. Well, with the tactical beyond visual line of sight, this would allow us to be able to fly underneath a bridge or on the backside of a building and still be within the rules. And so it add a lot more flexibility on what we could do with the drones. Uh, another part of flying Beyond the visual line of sight, um, the state of North Dakota is working with industry on creating a program called Vantis, which is a statewide network that enables UAS flights beyond the visual line of sight. Um, it, it basically uses uh, our own towers and systems that are in North Dakota to communicate with each other to then track where the drones are and communicate, you know, what needs to be done. Uh, the system's still being worked on, but when it's done, it'll be a, a game changer in the industry and what they can do. And to show a little bit more, I've got a little uh, short little video that kind of talks about it. I'll show next. As Americans, we've come a long way, but one thing never changes. To get where we're going, we need a path forward. We can follow one, or we can build one. With Vantis, we're building one in the sky. Vantis is North Dakota's statewide UAS network. It's still in the works, but when complete, it will enable UAS flights beyond visual line of sight across the entire state. The part that makes Vantis unique over any other type of network is that it's a, a single package that brings together all of the elements that are required to fly beyond the line of sight. It incorporates the uh, remote surveillance component of, of radars. Uh, it brings in the command and control that's required. It's all connected through a 
backhaul network that feeds into a mission network operation center. These are all components that are, are required to fly beyond the Vision site, and you get it all with Mantis. UAS can be flown around town, across the state, and even eventually across the country without interruptions in service. This enables operations like package delivery, utility inspections, search and rescue missions, agricultural, medical test delivery, Things that have not even become a reality because Vance's is the first of its kind. This is going to bring in companies to North Dakota. This is the high tech emerging industry. National companies doing aviation you know, systems will be coming here to test, validate, implement their systems. The operators flying the aircraft and the end users like the electric utility industry, the railroads, the oil and gas industry will be now improving their operations and doing that here in North Dakota because we're enabled unmanned aircraft with Vantis. Vantis is really created to support the commercial industry. There's a single network that multiple users will be able to take advantage of. Imagine if you had to build your own road to get anywhere. Imagine if the fire department, the postal service, the trucking companies, everyone had to build their own roads. That makes no earthly sense. We don't think it makes sense in the sky either. We are starting our initial key site is in the western part of the state where we have direct needs and benefits now. Moving there will expand to the eastern part of the state and then eventually connect the entire state together. Our industry partners, the commercial operators, they want to have this network be deployed all over the country. And we're taking that into consideration. We're working with our federal partners like the FAA in order to make sure that what we're deploying is meeting industry standards and is something that's going to be scalable beyond the borders of North Dakota. This is where we want to go in the state of North Dakota. This is where the FAA wants to go too, and we're doing that in partnership. These are the giants in manned aviation infrastructure. They have now partnered with the state of North Dakota to take that technology expertise from the manned aviation world and help build the unmanned Vantis infrastructure here in North Dakota. Vantis is the future for UAS. Welcome to the high road. Welcome to Vantis. So, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of uh, things still coming with the, the UAS program, and uh, we're making some great strides. And uh, so, uh, at that time, I'll uh, leave it up to questions. All right. Well, thanks, Darren. That was another uh, very informational presentation. It uh, sure is fun to see the advancements of the drones in, uh, in our industry. Uh, as far as questions, uh, we got a couple questions for you here. Uh, so uh, one is, how do you get a drone license and why is licensing needed? Uh, currently right now for us, since we are flying for business, since we're getting paid, we need a commercial drone pilot's license. Uh, it's a part 107 license, which you will take a test through the FAA. Uh, if you're just flying recreationally, um, pretty sure you don't need a license to fly. Okay. Sure. Uh, and that's about it for questions at the moment here. So I don't really have anything else to add at this moment. And See no further questions coming in. You guys might be getting off uh, easy here today with the amount of questions. So, <laughs> but uh, that being the case, I guess I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, today's presenters uh, and a big thank you to everyone for attending today's presentation here. Uh, please uh, join us next week at 2 p.m. for our fourth session where we will hear updates from the design division on a variety of topics as well as waters of the U.S., 404 permitting requirements, and aquatic resource from environmental and transportation services. And I see I got one more question for you, Darren, if you're available today. 
is uh, UAS data acceptable for measurements on construction projects? Uh, it, it depends on what measurements you're looking at. Um, we are looking at doing some uh, like seeding quantities and measuring things like that. I would say as of right now, borrow quantities um, still should shoot the traditional way with GPS. But we're, we hope to uh, get there in the future. Right now we're looking at just doing intermittent, intermittent borrow quantities, like uh, during the summer, if you're in a borrow pit for two months, to do one every week or bi-weekly. That way you can keep accurate quantities of what's coming out of there. But as of right now, we're not set up to take it as a final payment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, that's the extent of the questions we've had come through on the chat box here. So I think we'll uh, wrap it up. So.